Okay, I'm going to get really pretty personal in this audio, so maybe turn it off if you're not interested. I call it eating peas because that's really what it boils down to for me. I don't know if the issues that I have with God are similar to yours or not. Again, because I don't know your circumstances, I don't know how to generalize this except to give my own. So we ended the last increment with, you know, what do you really want out of the life? And I'd sort of gotten a bit autobiographical in that when I said that, you know, God was basically kicking me out of the nest. Um, he doesn't want me to want the future that he has planned for me simply because of him. Which is a real surprise. And yet not because a parent really wants your ch the child to have his own happiness. Okay, if you really love your kids, you want them to grow up independent of you, and obviously you have certain values you want them to share, and you want to have a close relationship with them, but you want to cut the umbilical cord. Real parents want to do that. Part of it is, you know, they have a right to their own life. They spent 20 years getting you ready, and, you know, it's time. And that's a valid thing to say. Part of it, though, also is that the person needs to grow. The child needs to, to be his own person, have his own wants, whether they're the same or not, as the parents. Well, you know, God is the ultimate parent. And my big hickey in the spiritual life, as I've been saying on a number of occasions, because I, you know, I have to represent a large group of people in my own problems, so they have to be somewhat representative, um, has been this whole idea of being in charge, being a parent. Okay, I that that whole idea just flummoxes me. Okay, I'm, I'm the kind of personality who would be really great on a desert island or trapped behind, you know, you know, stuck in Antarctica watching instruments. A, a loner. I've always been a loner. It's not that I don't want close relationships, but the kind of people who actually can understand me are very few. And it's always um, hard on them. Because apparently the way my brain works is like alien to theirs. You know, they're into people, persons, and parades, and events, and shopping, and all this stuff. And I've just, that just doesn't work for me. I'm not quite the nerd type who ought to be, you know, behind a, you know, behind the glass in the lab coat with the beaker. I'm not quite like that. I'm more social than that. But... I don't know, it's just the way my brain works. A lot of people can't identify with it. And so it's hard for me to... It's not that I've never have had friends, and I, there are a lot of people who care about me, but and I care about them in return, but closeness has just not been in the cards for me, ever. The only, the only kinds of relationships I ever seem to have with people are whether I'm advising them and they're very happy to have it, and I'm happy to do it. But the intimacy of friendship isn't there. It is a closeness, and it is a strong relationship. But it's more official. It's got an official basis. And the friendship sort of comes out of that. But when, you know, I can, most of my clients I've never even met. And they care a lot about me, and I'm important to them, and they're important to me, but we've never even met. It's that kind of weirdness. Um, where they're willing to put their, you know, their financial lives in my hands, and I'm more than willing to lay down my life for them, but we would not really have much dinner together. You see what I'm saying? So, this, you know, parenting is a whole different ballgame. With parenting, you've got that hierarchy and dependence and willingness to commit. All that stuff is there in parenting. But parenting is also the small talk. 
okay? Your child had came in and he hurt his finger and he needs a band-aid and he needs a hug and and he needs, you know, you to change his his clothes and tuck him in at night and all that stuff. And I'm not saying I wouldn't like that. But I don't understand it. I may be willing to do it and I'd even enjoy it. But I don't understand it. And I'm supposed to. I'm, I'm going to start to cry now. And I don't understand why. Why do I feel like crying? Um, I don't understand that kind of intimacy. There's another kind of intimacy where you have, you know, the guy and the gal, they get married and they're n not only lovers as a result, but they're also best friends. I kind of don't understand that either. Um, so, I'm not sure if I can explain it as fear or reticence, but there's some kind of big barrier in my mind about this whole future because the future that God has planned for each one of us, and I'm sure you're more capable of adjusting to it than I am is kingship and kingship does mean parenting and it means it total it's not kingship the way we think of today where it's just aloofness those elements are in the eternal kingship also but because God is in us as we are in God there's gonna be a, a that's an intimacy so when you're relating to God, it's not simply because of the rules and the rights and the wrongs. He's with you in everything and wants to be. He's your best friend. He's your, as you could, I mean, if you eliminate the sexual angle, he's your lover. He's everything. The relationship with God is absolutely total in every single way that there is, eliminating, of course, the stupid sex angle. Because the whole idea of sex, the way God designed it, was to, to increase the intimacy, increase the bonding. With God, you don't need sex to have the increase in the bonding, okay? So I, I have that with him. I understand how it works. I've always known him that way. And I don't even know how to live without it. So on the one hand, I'm totally not able to fathom the parent eyes to the child with that kind of intimacy. And I'm not able to fathom the, you know, the husband-wife kind of intimacy. You know, where they're your best friend and you've, you know, been through everything together and it doesn't even have to mean anything. From the husband's point of view, I understand it. I do not understand it from the wife's point of view. I don't know how to relate. But the kingship includes those kinds of intimacies. Again, if you take out the sex thing and you take out the fact, you know, a child, parent-child, you know, there are many kinds of parenting and childishness. You know, I mean, because we're all going to be light years higher in our abilities and everything when we're in heaven. But there's still going to be a great difference between us. The king is literally living for his kingdom in the eternal state. Literally. God doesn't want to be God if he can't design the things the way he did. If he can't pour himself into us, he doesn't want to be God. It's far beyond what he can do. It's what he wants. This is what the Calvinists don't get. They're so right to say God is sovereign, but they have no idea how sovereign. God lives because he wants to. God is the way he is because he wants to. There's nothing constraining him. There's nothing determining him. Truth is what he says it is because he says so. Righteousness is what it is because he says so. And he can stop saying so at any moment, but he never wants to. He is a hunt. He is like, how do you want to call? Absolutely sovereign. The Calvinists don't understand sovereignty. They think that if man had free will, somehow that cuts into God's sovereignty. Excuse me. You can't.
can't cut into God's sovereignty. You have free will because He says so. You're you you have total one hundred percent free will in every respect because He wants it that way. But Calvin never got it. That Calvin was retarded. He never understood God. He never actually got to know God. And this is your proof of it. Free will doesn't affect God. It doesn't alter or change or impact anything he is and does. In fact, he ensures it. And he's already baptized every single thing, bad, good, or indifferent. And all the what-ifs. Because he decided what they were to start with. So, you know, are you forced to make the decisions you do? No. He already kitted it out. It's like going into a store and you don't know what your friends are going to want for supper. So you buy everything in the store and the store is stocked with every kind of food that can exist. And then your friends choose what it is they want to eat. You did not limit your friends' free will, did you? Whereas if you just bought Cheetos and then your friends come over, then all they've got to eat is Cheetos and now you've limited their free will unless they leave you. You get that? I can do anything I want. I can certainly pray for anything I want. And I'll get it. That's promised six times in the New Testament, Christ says so. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. I believe him. In fact, I'm a little bit worried because... You know, there were certain prayers I didn't want to pray because I was afraid I'd get them. And I felt, well, that's stupid. I better pray for it anyway. Because what if God wants me to pray for it? So those are the two sides of the coin with this kingship thing. Anything in his name you can get. Well, what do you think it's going to be like in the eternal state if it's this way down here? You can do anything, you can have anything, you can be anything. Now, most of us find that option way too high and mind-boggling. So we automatically assume that God's trying to deprive us or restrict us and we're holy if we suffer the deprivation. That's the opposite of what he's doing. It's much harder to have everything and be everything. And then choose amongst every, all the choices. I mean, he's God. You have to be God to actually. I mean, he created the choices even. It's beyond having everything and choosing among. He created the choices. He created the be free. Well, what do you think you're going to be as a king? You can have anything, do anything, be anything. What are you going to choose? And we can ask for anything down here, so it starts here. That just boggles my mind. And then you got a kingdom who's going to be dependent on you having all those abilities and choices and wealth, and you're going to want to kill yourself for them. And you're living for them, and they're living for you, honey. It's total intimacy, as well as total authority. And total subordination to authority. That's what everybody's going to want. Freely want. Because that's what God freely wants. That's what the cross is. Each God is subordinating to the other one. Each God is having authority over the other one. Don't you see that? Yeah, okay, he calls himself Father, but what is he doing when he imputes sins to Christ? He's subordinating to the desire of Christ. Yeah, Christ calls himself son, subordinate to the Father, but it's his desire that, how do you want to call it? It's because Christ wants to go to the cross that Father wants to impute the sins. So the the person who's really equal, choosing to be lesser, you know, Philippians 2, is actually the reason why the one who's higher goes lower. Because Father's going low too. When he imputes sins to his own son, that's not something he would natively want to do. But he wants to do it because the son wants it. And the son wants it because of what it's going to do for father. Because it gives the son more things he can create for father. Even as as son of God, he created the universe. Genesis 1-1. It's talking about Christ being the creator there. 
We find that out from Isaiah 45, 7. And 18 and 19. And what is the Spirit doing? Well, it's His authority too, because if He doesn't choose to hold Christ together so that Christ can receive the sins, then guess what? The whole plan tanks. So Father subordinating the Spirit, trusting Him to actually do this, the Spirit's obviously subordinating to the desire of Christ and Father. But in a sense, He's holding all the keys. You can argue that Spirit's holding all the keys. And they're subordinating to Him. And Spirit likes to call Himself Mom. Hebrew Rachaf in Genesis 1-2. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. It's Some translations say brooded, and that's even better, because it means like a mother hen brooding over her chicks. So he's calling himself Mom. Okay, so doesn't that remind you of a family hello? The father's really deferring to the mother. The son is really deferring to the mother. The mother's really deferring to the father and the son. And yet each one is in authority over the others because the others are doing deferring out of their own free will. I'm just, I just stare at that information open mouthed every day. That's how they think. That's what they want. That's why this design is what it is. It's a three way gifting. And we're smack dab in the middle of that inner relationship among the three of them. And, and I'm not really sure why Satan rejected this. Surely he knew long before man was created. It would have been obvious in some manner, even with the angels. If a dumb brain out can know it, then they knew about it before I even existed. I'm not sure where Satan went wrong with that. I'm having trouble with it because I think it's the intensity and the closeness and the reality of it being so true. Maybe you like that. I mean, I like it too in context. And I look at everything else in life now, and honey, it just doesn't compare. You give me all the money on the planet, that would bore me. You give me all the whatever people think is important on this planet, and I don't want it. I'm not interested. I just soon go crawl into a hole, live on a desert island, do nothing. And if I'm to grow in the spiritual life, I have to accept the intensity of this inner intimacy. Because I'm supposed to become a king. And this is what kingship means. It's the same mental attitude. 24-7 and you live for it. And I, I can't say I'm scared. I'm not sure what it is that bothers me about it. It's not exactly fear. I can't say I don't like it. But I, I want to avoid it. And I don't know why. Honestly, no. I don't know why I want to run away from this. So you see, a person can be empowered, as it were, to know scripture inside out and really understand it, and really know God even, and be articulate and all this other stuff that he's given me to be able to do in the videos and the web pages and all that stuff for years. But you know what? That doesn't mean there are no problems. It doesn't mean I'm like this saint, even though technically that's my title and yours. This is my big sticking point in the relationship, and I honestly don't know if I'll make it. So if I don't, I hope you do. And if you wondered where it was all going to lead to, honey, this is it. And maybe the issue for you is different. For me, it's the, it's the total intimacy of it. And it'll never die. And I'm crying now, so I'm just going to quit. Peace out.